My name is Nakul Gupta. I'm a body radiologist at Houston Methodist. And we're going to talk today about GSI Extreme and True Fidelity in Body Imaging. These are my disclosures. So first, we're going to talk about True Fidelity or Deep Learning Based Image Reconstruction. So it's a True Fidelity is a deep learning based image reconstruction technique, which uses low dose sinograms as input data and uh, was trained using high dose, high F uh, high fidelity filter back projection images as ground truth. And the, specifically, the, tr the algorithm was optimized to, um, or rather was trained to optimize low contrast detectability, noise power spectrum, spatial resolution, uh, uniformity, accuracy, and artifact suppression. So uh, one of these most important properties is the noise power spectrum. And this is, uh, what, what it is, is it's the frequency distribution of noise in your image. So iterative reconstruction techniques, for instance, have, while they may have lower noise overall, the noise power spectrum is shifted towards lower spatial frequencies. And uh, that's shown in this graph here in the yellow. And that's what's thought to result in the sort of blotchy or plasticky appearance of iterative reconstruction images. So DLIR, by contrast, has a frequency distribution or noise power spectrum, which is very similar to FBP, which gives it that more natural texture that we're all used to. Here are some sample images, uh, top row being reconstructed with Acer V at 0%, 30%, 100%, 100%, 100%, and bottom row being true fidelity um, at low, medium, and high strength. And you can see kind of across the board that the deep learning reconstruction images from true fidelity have a much more natural noise texture than the you know higher strength HRV images and uh, tend to have lower noise levels uh, overall. So what are some of the use cases? Well, one is uh, large patients, for example, is one place where you'll see a big benefit from this technique. Um, so here's a, uh, the two images on the right are where I want you to focus first. Um, so those are the same image at the same level, 2.5 millimeter slice thickness uh, from the same scan, same patient reconstructed with Acer V and then deep learning medium. So you can see immediately that the deep learning based uh, reconstruction on the far right has a much lower noise level and also has reduced streak artifacts. And you can see here there's reduced streak artifacts while at the same time having lower noise. And then if you compare that with the prior study from the same patient on a Rev CT without deep learning, we achieved all that with lower dose and lower slice thickness as well. So low KVP scanning is also an area where uh, deep learning recon really shines. And here's an example, uh, 80 KVP scan in an adult patient uh, with a CTDI of six, very you know, reasonable dose level, ACRV 30%, you know, has moderate noise, whereas the deep learning uh, medium strength image has much lower noise level while maintaining, you know, um, uh, a very natural image texture and also maintaining contours. You know, one thing that we've noticed, you know, when you use very high levels of iterative reconstruction is some of the contours can become a little distorted and uh, smooth, otherwise smooth contours might start to look a little jagged. And that's not the case with deep learning. Uh, thin slice scans, another area of strength for uh, deep learning recon or true fidelity. Here's an example. The uh, left and middle images here are uh, a portal venous phase scan uh, of the liver in a patient with cirrhosis and with a uh, left hepatic lobe HCC, which you can see on the far right image as a hypervascular nodule with you know somewhat subtle washout on the portal venous phase. And you can see the ACRV image at two and a half millimeter slice thickness and the deep learning medium strength at 1.25 millimeter slice thickness have very similar you know, noise properties, very similar lesion conspicuity, despite the reduced slice thickness with the DL recon. And uh, there's a lesion just in case uh, it wasn't uh, it wasn't that visible. And then, yeah, you can see here, even objectively, the noise level is very similar between the two images, despite having half the slice thickness on the DL medium. Another example of a thin slice study for hyaluronic carcinoma staging. Here's a patient that had a prior study with Acer V at 40%. And you can see the subsequent follow up scan with deep learning has a lower noise, uh, lower noise overall. And this, with the very similar or very natural feeling noise texture, and at the same time having sharper delineation of these intrahepatic bile ducts. And uh, you achieve all these benefits without losing, you know, uh, low contrast or small lesion detectability. And here's a good example of that: patient of prior scan at uh, very similar dose levels on the Rev HD at 120 kilo, uh, kVp. You see in the posterior right hepatic lobe a small low contrast lesion. And then on the subsequent scan on the Revolution Apex using deep learning medium at 100 kVp, 
it's if uh, if anything it's even more conspicuous than before so you're not losing you know um, you're not smoothing over small lesions here Uh, coronary CTA was actually one of the first places that we implemented deep learning reconstruction. And uh, you can see on this 0.625 millimeter slice thickness scan, uh, the ACRV image on the left with 50% strength versus the deep learning medium strength, you get a slightly sharper vessel boundaries while at the same time having a more homogeneous blood pool. And uh, we find this to be, you know, uh, we've applied this now across the board to all CTA exams for this reason. And low contrast detectability is another area where uh, deep learning reconstruction can be helpful. And here's an example of that showing a you know, hypervascular lesion of, you know, I would say low to mid contrast level uh, requiring pretty you know, aggressive window level adjustments to make it conspicuous. And if anything, on the deep learning medium reconstruction on the right, you can see that the lesion is more conspicuous than it was on the HRV image. And uh, just to kind of show you guys the contrast level, uh, contrast difference between lesion and background here was about 17 household units. I look at that same lesion in the portal, uh, sorry, in the delayed phase before the washout phase, and you can see pretty much the same thing that, you know, the, the contrast, the target to background uh, contrast is, if anything, more conspicuous on the deep learning medium recon than it was on ACRV. And again, this is about a 16 house unit difference between lesion and background. So low dose lung screening is another area where we've implemented this and with great effect, because you can see here uh, why the, uh, this is the same patient subsequent, uh, sorry, previous scan done on a light speed VCT at 1.6 milligrays. And you can see there's a lot of streak artifacts, particularly in the dependent portion of the lungs. And there's a, sort of a you know, fairly high noise level overall, which we're used to seeing in these low dose scans. But you uh, apply deep learning on that same patient now. And with the CTDI of 1.06, which is about you know, two thirds of the previous dose, you get a much cleaner image, less noise, and that streak artifact is almost gone in the dependent portion of the lungs. So to summarize some of the literature on the topic, um, so fandom studies have shown that the noise power spectrum of true fidelity or deep learning based reconstruction is much more similar to FBP than uh, iterative reconstruction was. And that's part of what gives it that more natural texture than uh, iterative reconstruction. It consistently achieves higher subjective IQ scores or image quality scores uh, in reader studies. Data on sharpness and resolution are a little limit, are a little mixed. Um, there was one phantom study where there was shown maybe a subtle loss of sharpness for small low contrast lesions, and then one reader study where readers commented that their uh, that they felt small lesions may not be quite as sharp with deep learning, although that was mainly affecting the high strength deep learning recon. And in that same study, they also noted that adjusting window level settings could compensate for that. And overall, they still prefer the deep learning medium strength as their you know, preferred method. And it had also been shown that uh, sharpness has is actually increased and improved in high contrast tasks like uh, angiography, which we showed earlier in, con in coronary angiography and other types of CTA. All right, so I'm now switching gears and talking about GSI Extreme for a few minutes. So liver imaging is a big use case of uh, GSI or dual energy CT for us. And here's an example why. So this image layout here, just to orient you, the top left corner is the 120 kvp like or 120 kvp equivalent monoenergetic image. And in this case, it was at 74 keV. To the right of that, you have a 50 keV monoenergetic image. Below that, you have the same 50 keV image, but with a color map applied. And then bottom left, you have an iodine image. So in this uh, case, what you can see is that there is, uh, on, on the 120 kVp image, there's a very subtle area of hypervascularity in the right hepatic lobe, which is very hard to delineate. And you can see that that becomes much more conspicuous when you go to uh, the 50 keV, and especially when you apply the color map to it. The iodine map, again, uh, also very conspicuous and very easy to delineate the borders of the lesion. So it is a very similar case, similar image layout. And again, you can see in this case, the abnormality is more rounded or mass-like in the right lobe of the liver. And uh, same thing, very subtle and hard to delineate on the 120 kVp-like image. But uh, once you go down to 50 kV and look at the iodine maps, it's you know a much uh, more conspicuous lesion, much easier to detect and much more uh, easy to delineate. 
Pancreas is another area where GSI can be tremendously helpful. Uh, this is an example of a patient, she's a 72 year old lady, and uh, the top image is a coronal sort of magnified view of the pancreatic head from her prior study, which is at single energy. And you can see there's a, you know, a sort of complex cystic lesion in the pancreatic head, a couple of calcifications in it. And you might be able to make out a few septations, but it's hard to sort of get a feel for the true complexity of the lesion. Now you look at the iodine map uh, right below it, I, you know, they're co-registered to as best we could given the, that they were from different scan sessions. Um, but you can see far more detail in the lesion. You can see the septations much more clearly and the sort of enhancing soft tissue elements much more clearly. Uh, another use case in the pancreas is in uh, neuroendocrine tumors or hypervascular pancreatic lesions. And you know, these can be fairly subtle on uh, CT and you know, in fact, this patient had a single energy scan done about a few months prior, which uh, didn't show any abnormality. And but the surgeon was still convinced that the patient had an insulinoma based on labs and the clinical presentation. And so we did a follow up study then with dual energy. And here you can see the result of that. This is a similar layout to the previous cases where we have on the top left your 120 kVp like image, and then your 50 kVs on the right, and then iodine on the bottom left. So uh, if you look at the mid body of the pancreas on the 120 kVp image, it's very difficult to appreciate that there may be a subtle hypervascular mass in the body of the pancreas. Now you move to 50 kV, especially with the color map applied, and it's much more plainly visualizable or visualized that there is a hypervascular lesion there, and uh, certainly so on the iodine map as well. Um, and uh, one other area that we use uh, GSI or dual energy is in uh, interventional oncology. And here's an example of a patient. The top left image here is the MRI where you can see a, an enhancing mass in the posterior right hepatic lobe. And this was an HCC in a cirrhotic patient. And we were going to do an ablation. And on the unenhanced CT, you know, this lesion can't really be seen. And so, let, so we did the ablation and we wanted to make sure because we couldn't really tell where the lesion was on the CT, we wanted to be sure we got the whole thing. So we went ahead and did a, a GSI scan and you can see the ablation cavity there uh, perfectly matching the lesion and with sort of the surrounding rim of hyperemia but without any nodular or mass like residual tumor. And sure enough, you do the, you know, comparing with the subsequent MRI, uh, you know, six weeks later, you can see that sort of a perfect match between the ablation cavity on the GSI image and on the MRI image. So a nice uh, correlation there. And so uh, what's changed for us now with the Quantix tube and uh, having that extra photon flux is we're able to do GSI on larger patients than before now. And here's a couple of examples of that. So uh, PE studies, we generally before the Quantix tube would have limited to a BMI of 32 or lower. And here's the case of the BMI of 38. This lady had a, a PE study and uh, 1.25 millimeter slice thickness. And you can see the iodine map is, you know, uh, very homogeneous, not a lot of, you know, not too much noise, not too much artifact, very usable iodine map, which previously uh, we would not have expected at this BMI. And on the right, you have a couple of images from the abdomen and pelvis. This is a patient with BMI of 50. And you can see in the abdomen, you know, where there's certainly a little bit of streak artifact happening, but you know, otherwise it seems to be a very usable image. Uh, although in the pelvis, we certainly ran out of photons there. Uh, so that's, uh, so, you know, usable in the abdomen, that BMI, probably not in the pelvis. Um, and then chest imaging, you know, another area where we use uh, GSI or dual energy and, you know, we use it more for the virtual monoenergetic imaging, not as much for the iodine maps. Um, and here's an example of w uh, why we like it here. And, you know, once in a while, despite your best efforts, you're going to get a suboptimal bolus in the pulmonary artery. And here's an example of that. Top image is, you know, your 120 kVp like image. So, you know, we're only getting 110 hospital units in the pulmonary artery here. Whereas, you know, and normally we would have to re-inject the patient and try again and uh, re-irradiate the patient. But here is a case, you know, we can just, you know, lower the kV to 50 kV. And now we go ahead and we have uh, 207 house units and have salvaged uh, an otherwise non-diagnostic exam. All right, um, and that's all. And these are some of the references if you, have, uh, if you want to explore further any of these topics. And thank you very much. Mm -hmm.